So um, as, as the title suggests, if you can make that out, why copyright reform isn't the cure for, for what ails the music industry. And what I'm going to focus on here uh, is primarily on many of the talking points and arguments that, that we've heard for, for many, many years around copyright reform in Canada, particularly coming out of uh, the Recording Industry Association, Canadian Recording Industry Association, now calling itself Music Canada. And, and as I'm sure everybody knows, uh, CREA or Music Canada has been certainly the most outspoken group when it comes to copyright reform coming out of the, the music world in Canada, arguably the most outspoken group uh, for, uh, amongst any rights holder in Canada when it comes to copyright. And so when the new bill was introduced, it was C-32, uh, we're just playing with numbers now. It's now C-11 in Canada because the government fell and so a new bill was introduced. Uh, unsurprisingly, the industry was, was encouraging, happy encouraging people to tweet at or email the ministers to thank them for reintroducing the legislation. They, about a year and a half ago, established this site here, Balanced Copyright for Canada, which was designed to create sort of a, some grassroots support, uh, primarily out of the industry, for this sort of reform. And if you followed much of the debate and discussion on these issues over the last number of years, you know that the primary talking point, unsurprisingly, is that record sales are down and have been down for a number of years now. And, and the argument is um, that copyright reform is the solution to solve that issue. And so the argument is often a very short one. It, it points to a, a chart like this to say, here's where the, the revenues are going from a recorded music perspective. Uh, we need copyright reform to come and, and save that situation or solve that situation. And so what I want to do, frankly, is make the case that those talking points are wrong. Uh, I want to focus primarily on the legal side. I'm a law prof after all. And so we're going to get to some of the key elements that is, that is within C11, which with what was C32. But before that, I think it's important to at least uh, take head on my perspective on why some of the positioning that we've seen on this issue uh, is in fact wrong, and then get to why I think their positioning on the bill itself uh, is also wrong. Um, but let's start with uh, the talking points, and of course the very first one that, that you hear about is sales. Sales are down, and so it's, it's this chart, as I mentioned, that we hear about. In some ways, I think, frankly, the far more relevant chart when you take a look at music as a whole in Canada would be this one. That's actually what I showed you was just a slice out of a larger uh, chart. And the larger chart indicates that, in fact, while recorded music sales may be down, Overall, revenues are up, uh, not up a ton, depending on whatever year you happen to take a look at, but up more generally. And in the current economy, that's not an all bad thing to all, all bad position to be in. And that reflects the fact that while the sale of recorded music may have struggled over the last number of years, uh, there have been increased revenues, certainly from performances, some, some amount from publishing. And of course, you could see one of, one of the bars there that was virtually non-existent even a few years ago from internet and digital sales, which is an increasingly important part uh, of the overall puzzle. And so if we're going to take a look at the, the sales data and overall revenue, we've got to take a look at, look at it as a whole. In fact, if we even compare how Canada has done to many other countries, the situation isn't nearly as dire uh, as I think some would suggest. Uh, this comes from the Recording Industry Numbers Annual Report, seen as the, the Bible of the industry in terms of numbers from around the world. Canada ranks seventh worldwide as a, physical, as a market for physical sales of music. We're actually sixth for digital. So we actually have a stronger digital market than we have physical market. Uh, physical sales market relative to what you find in other jurisdictions. In fact, if you look at the percentage of digital sales in Canada, um, far from being an environment where there are no digital sales or it's just a wild west as is sometimes described, we actually do better than almost every other developed country in the world. The, the big exception to that is the United States, which had a head start relative to where we're at. And frankly, the Americans seem to buy more online of everything. Uh, than Canadians do. They buy more clothes, they buy more jewelry, they buy a whole sorts of other things, more than almost any other country in the world, and they do so for music as well. When you compare us to many other countries, though, you actually find that our percentage of digital sales uh, has grown to the point that we're ahead of most other countries. In fact, even if you compare where Canada is at relative to the United States, you find that for the last five consecutive years, digital music sales have grown faster in Canada than they have in the United States. Um, and so that's for the last five straight years. We're still, as you saw, well below the, where the U.S. is as an overall metric. But since they started earlier, um, that reflects the fact that they're higher up. Over the last number of years, even while the U.S. is almost flatlined on digital music sales, Canadian sales have actually grown, as you can see, quite a lot faster. 
In fact, that reflects where, the, where StatsCan says the numbers are as well, where profits uh, of labels have actually increased over the last number of years. Admittedly, much of that's by trying to reduce costs as opposed to increasing the amount of revenue, uh, but that's the numbers that StatsCan has. So the sales side is, is at, at a minimum more complicated um, than is sometimes suggested. I think so too is the issue around the decline itself, because unquestionably there has been this decline, and the argument that you hear from groups like CREA uh, is that most of this is attributable to peer-to-peer -to -peer file, peer -peer file sharing. If it wasn't for P2P, the argument goes, um, this decline wouldn't be happening. I think that reality also is, the re reality is that that is also far more complicated a situation than simply drawing a straight line between peer-to-peer -peer and music sales. Uh, this is actually a far larger chart that highlights units shipped uh, since 1973. Uh, and what you find is that for certainly a, a good period of time, um, at least part of the sales were driven by replacement to formats, right? So eight tracks to cassettes um, to and LPs, somewhat consistent, but gradually moving away, and then, of course, on to CDs. What you do find, I think, is that there was a period of time in the early, two, in the early 1990s, almost in the mid-1990s, if you look where the big bubble of sales are, the, the by far the highest metrics from, let's say, about 93, 94 till around 98, 99, that's almost all CD sales. And while I'm sure there was some really great music coming out at that point in time, the notion that somehow we were seeing you know, a 50% or 80% increase in music sales solely because there were better releases coming at that point in time, I, I think simply doesn't accord with reality. The reality is this was a golden age bubble for an industry where they were able to resell music that had been sold in earlier formats, whether in A-tracks, LPs, or cassettes, and now we're being sold again in CD sales. So when we start talking about the decline in music sales, and the metric is always usually 1998-99, the emergence of Napster, and the argument is, well, look at the decline we've seen from 98-99. Recognize that we're not just talking, we're talking about what was in some ways a bubble in terms of the kinds of sales that the industry was experiencing at that point in time. It was selling huge amounts of music that had already been sold uh, and was not going to be sold yet again. And if we're going to take a fairer metric, it's probably fair to take a look at what sales were like at the beginning of the 90s, uh, before when, when we were selling CDs, but it hadn't been accepted in the same way that it, that it is today. And in fact, then if you take a look at the numbers, the decline isn't nearly as sharp, uh, because in fact, there was this bubble where you had, I think, a large amount of sales attributable to people repurchasing music they may have already purchased. The studies out there that have taken a look at the impact of peer-to-peer -peer on music sales are decidedly mixed. And so there are unquestionably studies out there that have come to the conclusion that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing has had a negative impact on the industry. There are also studies that have come to the opposite conclusion. This is one that was commissioned by the Canadian government, by Industry Canada, that took a look that actually found, if anything, potentially a bit of a positive correlation between people who file share music and people who then buy, turn around and buy music. It's the people who are most interested in music uh, that tend to file share and they, by extension, may still purchase. So the jury is at a minimum out. I don't think anyone would suggest there isn't an impact. There are surely people out there who have downloaded music that, but for the availability of peer-to-peer -peer and the ability to download that song, would have purchased. Uh, and so that clearly represents a dead loss. There are others out there who would never have been aware of the band or the songs to begin with um, and discovered them through peer-to-peer -peer and actually go ahead and purchase because of that. And so how all of that sorts out in terms of the overall bottom line uh, economists continue, frankly, to debate, and, and there isn't a, a hard conclusion one way or the other. I also think this debate overlooks a number of other crucial factors that have taken place over the last 10 to 15 years that clearly had a major impact on sales. I frankly argue that Walmart uh, would be amongst the very largest. Uh, I grew up in Toronto and can remember going on a Saturday, Saturdays like this down to Sam the Record Man in downtown Toronto to go take a look at music. Um, around that period of time, during that bubble uh, era of the CD sale, we saw a shift from the large music retailers towards the big box retailers, like, like the Walmarts and the Costcos and the Targets. Um, that provided, I think, a real short-term gain for the industry, because obviously these, these stores sell huge amounts of volume, uh, but I think it came at a cost, and it came at a cost in two ways. One is for labels long, long dependent on catalog sales for anywhere from 25 to 
of their music sales, they found that when you walked into your local Costco or Target or Walmart, they weren't carrying much of a catalog anymore. They were carrying a few hundred, at best a few thousand titles, compared to the tens of thousands of titles that were sold in the larger record stores. And so for consumers that might have wanted to purchase many of those, many of the, many of the CDs out of the older catalogs, they simply weren't finding it in the retailer um, that was where they were now being encouraged, in a sense, to buy. And so that hurt, clearly hurt catalog sales. I think it also hurt price point. And so if you take a look at the, at the data from the early 2000s, what you find is that revenues drop, sharp, dropped at a faster rate than did actually unit shipped. The reason is Walmart was selling uh, these CDs at a far lower price point than did Sam the Record Man or any of the other retailers. And so the actual <coughs> revenues that, you, that were being accrued out of these CDs were lower than they had been earlier on, which hurt revenue, even as, in some instances, the units <coughs> being shipped and sold weren't that lower. In fact, I'd argue that the industry never quite got why Walmart was in this to begin with. I remember being told of a story where the, some, some members of a major label were in at Walmart to pitch a new service that they were proposing for Walmart where they said the consumer could come in and they'd be able to, to essentially burn their own CD of a, of a series of songs. Uh, so this was seen as a sort of a customization, a kind of a, a new way to use the technology. And the industry person turns to, turns to the Walmart representative and says, you know, the only problem is it's going to take about 30 minutes um, from the time they make these selections until the CD is actually uh, completed. And the person from Walmart turns around and says, can you make it 60? From their perspective, it wasn't about, it wasn't about the 30 minutes. Was that they, it was all about getting customers into the store. It wasn't about trying to sell CDs. In fact, CDs were in many ways a lost leader to try to sell the, all the other things that the Walmarts and the Targets and the Costcos were trying to sell. And so if your price point is being reduced and being reduced rapidly, that has a major impact on what your bottom line starts to look like. Finally, of course, around that same time in the late 90s, we start seeing new competition as well. And in this case, the new competition comes in the form primarily of DVDs, but not only DVDs, video games as well. So for even for the larger stores that we used to think of as record stores, they no longer became record stores, they became entertainment stores. And those entertainment stores were ones where you literally tripped over the DVDs and the video games in order to find the CDs, which were increasingly located at the back end of the store. For those choosing from amongst what is still a limited entertainment dollar, you still have a limit on how much you can spend, you were now choosing not just amongst music, but you were choosing amongst DVDs, music, video games, and a whole range of other things. There was now competition for that dollar that I think quite clearly had an impact as well. So yes, there has been a decline, uh, but I think that decline has come from a number of different factors. And peer-to-peer, -peer, it's certainly not copyright, isn't going to solve all of that. The talking point then goes to say, well, okay, fine, if you're going to talk, you can talk about the other revenues we have, or you can talk about these other sources, but what about the artists? Isn't it the case that there will be less investment in artists if our members coming out of Korea are making less money. And I think that the reality, again, if we take a look at the data that comes out of Statistics Canada, suggests that the answer, at least to date, is largely no. In fact, if you take a look at data, this, most, this is the most recent stuff that comes from Statistics Canada, what you find is that almost all the investment in Canadian artists come from independent Canadian labels. They don't come from the foreign-controlled large major labels that are by and large represented by CREA. And so if you take a look, has there been a decline in the number of artists? Absolutely. But according to the data from Statistics Canada, there hasn't been a decline in the number of new releases that are coming from Canadian artists. The decline in Canada has come largely from foreign artists. And the reason for that is if you take a look at both at the new releases as well as at the revenue numbers, you find that the Canadian industry is certainly facing the same challenges everybody else is facing, but they are still investing in Canadian artists in a way that many of the major labels, frankly, never have. Um, the extent to which they do, they do it almost as a farm system, where I mean, you start with a smaller Canadian independent label and later uh, so-called graduate on to someone else. But the reality is Canadian artists are still finding opportunities, still finding labels willing to invest, and by and large, they're the same labels who are investing in Canadian artists from the very beginning. So this may be the chart that's raised when we start talking about the sort of talking points around copyright, as I'm trying to suggest. Uh, it's a much more complicated situation uh, than is often raised. But let's, that, that's sort of the background, because you bring all of those talking points, and then the argument then shifts quickly to say, OK, fine. Uh, this is our problem. We want copyright to come along and solve it. And as I've indicated right off the top, it's my view that the notion that copyright is going to come and uh, 
save the industry and solve, if we even agree that there is a, a problem to be solved, the notion that copyright is going to come along and fix all of this, I think, simply is untrue. Um, so let me explain why I think that is, and, and uh, uh, let me start just with one other caveat when it comes to the legal side, and this is this claim uh, that the law is antiquated and is in need of updating. And I should start by noting that I'm not opposed to copyright reform. I think good copyright reform is in the interests of everybody, um, both people from within the, the music world, but frankly from within the education world, from the consumer world, uh, from all sorts of different walks of life. Copyright matters to lots and lots of people. It's why it's become as controversial. It's why it's become uh, as vocal as it has. I think people recognize the impact that it can have uh, on so many different walks of life. Um, but we need copyright law that, and reform that makes sense, I think, for as many stakeholders as possible. Now, the claim is often made, well, we need to change because the law is really old. I was on a panel just yesterday, actually, um, in Ottawa, dealing with international law, and one of the claims of one of my fellow panelists was, this is a law that dates from 1911, uh, and so the implication is we're dealing with a 100-year-old law. Isn't it obvious we need desperately to make changes? In fact, the truth of the matter is we underwent major reforms in both the 1980s and again in the 1990s. In fact, the digital lock rules that we'll talk about in a couple of minutes uh, were proposed internationally even before we actually entered a new round of reform that took place in Canada in 1997. So we, are, we may be dealing with a law that has as its starting point the early 1990s, uh, the early 1900s rather, uh, but there have been significant changes. In fact, uh, many of those changes are very significant for uh, people from within music. And so as an example, we'll talk more about statutory damages in just a minute, but whether we're talking about statutory damages or the emergence of moral rights, uh, the private copying levy, ephemeral rights, the sorts of things that are, are still today fairly hot button issues, these are not changes or par parts of the law that date back to 1911. Uh, or 100 years. They date back 20 years or 30 years from more recent rounds of reforms. Can the law be updated? Absolutely. Is it a law that is literally go back to the horse and buggy? Uh, not really when you start taking a look at the vast majority of the provisions that exist within the law today. In fact, there are many areas where Canadian law is arguably stronger than it is in the United States. I'm not saying it's better than it is in the United States, but it is arguably stronger. All sorts of royalty systems, whether we're talking about broadcast royalties or mechanical royalties, that in many instances don't even exist in the United States, exist, uh, are, are here in Canada, the private copying levy. These reforms, I mean, if we even look back to the sorts of things that we saw both on the ephemeral side and the private copying levy side, all within the last several decades, we're talking literally about hundreds of millions of dollars that copyright reform, recent copyright reform has generated, particularly uh, on the music side throw in a whole series of other areas where we actually have fewer opportunities, are more restrictive than what you find in the United States. And this notion that we are weak and antiquated simply isn't true. Let me bring the, that brings me, though, to sort of the main part of what I want to focus on, C11, uh, and talk about the areas that, that Music Canada, let's say, the industry has tended to focus on, uh, and talk about why I think their position in this case, is, is, is wrong and, frankly, is not going to achieve what it says it's going to achieve for the industry as a whole. There are four areas I wanted to talk about. Statutory damages, Internet service provider liability, uh, what's called an enabler provision, uh, and digital locks. So we'll talk about those four. I will acknowledge that there are a couple of other provisions that have also generated a fair amount of discussion. I would characterize them as money provisions, and I'm happy to talk about them. Uh, during the break. The two of note, one is the private copying levy, um, a levy that currently exists on blank media such as blank CDs, and uh, the government is not proposing any changes to the current private copying system. There are certainly many within the industry that have sought to see that extended uh, to things like iPods, potentially to other sorts of devices. There's actually a, a proposal on the table right now that seeks to extend it to SD cards largely used, of course, in cameras, but the argument is some people are using SD cards to copy music, and so the Copyright Board is currently considering actually a proposal to put a new levy on all SD cards sold in Canada, um, and they, the industry would like to see this extended, as I say, to things like iPods and the like. For the moment, the government is quite firmly against it. They actually even, during the last election campaign, campaigned even against it, saying that they would never create a new iPod tax, 
Um, we can debate the merits of, uh, of extending the levy. Uh, I think, frankly, extending it to things like SD cards or iPods is not the right solution. Um, but nevertheless, uh, that's not in the bill, and that's clearly one that, that involves the potential to re generate some revenue. The other one has to do with what's often referred to as ephemeral rights. It's the act of making copies, particularly within the broadcast industry, radio stations, who may, who may make a copy from a CD onto a hard drive and play the music off of that hard drive. They pay for... Uh, they pay for having transferred that music from one format to another. Uh, it generates tens of millions of dollars. Um, and so one can well understand why the industry would not like to see that go away. One can also understand why the broadcast industry is, not, is, is unhappy paying for something for which they feel there is little economic value. Um, I don't see this as a major policy issue. It is strictly a, a fight uh, between two groups who are both, both see a pot of money and, and one wants to retain that pot of money and one wants to stop paying it. Uh, I can understand why they continue to argue it, um, but the impact in terms of the impact being felt by many other Canadians, by many other stakeholders is quite limited. It's really an industry fight over a particular pot of money. We could talk about it, but uh, it's not where the core focus has been. Instead, I want to focus, as I said, on these four areas. Let me start with statutory damages. And I'll become a bit more law profish um, if that's possible. Uh, I should note that the uh, industry uh, has described the proposed changes to statutory damages as a license to steal. I want to explain why I think that's wrong. Um, now, what do the statutory damages provisions say, or even what are statutory damages? It is the, the typical approach, you know, in most instances, if somebody sues someone for violating their rights, for causing some damage, what they have to do is prove what their actual damages are. You smashed my car, you did something to my property. What are the damages I sustained? And you seek from someone to, to be made whole by they pay the damages that I sustained. We have an exception to that when it comes to copyright infringement. And so the law for the last couple of decades in Canada is that where there is an infringement, the rights holder doesn't have to actually prove actual damages at all. The statute <coughs> says here are what the damages are, irregardless of what your actual damages might have been. And those damages range from a low of $500 to up to $20,000 per infringement. That's how we get, and there are similar rules in the United States, that's how you hear about these lawsuits against individual file shares that can quickly run into the millions of dollars because you're dealing with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in potential liability for even infringing or making a, uh, an, an unauthorized copy of just a single song. Now, I'd argue, and I think the government in this instance agrees, that when statutory damages were created, frankly, no one envisioned the prospect of seeing lawsuits against individuals for non-commercial infringement that would run into the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of dollars. And so what this legislation proposes to do is distinguish between, on the one hand, commercial infringement, where someone is taking your work, seeking to profit from it, making thousands of copies on something, and it says, for that kind of infringement, we are going to retain the statutory damages rule, so there is the prospect of these, the big liability. And we're going to distinguish that from cases of non-commercial infringement, uh, let's say the individual file share, for which we are going, going to create a $5,000 cap. Now, $5,000 in liability still doesn't strike me as all that small. Um, for someone that goes ahead and downloads a movie or a song or a number of songs, but nevertheless, that's the approach that they've taken. Now, note just by way of background that Canada is in the distinct minority of countries that has statutory damages at all, whether we're talking about commercial or non-commercial. In fact, most other developed countries around the world, almost all of them, I'd venture to say, don't have any statutory damages. Almost all of them say, prove what your actual damages are, and that, that ought to be good enough. So we're already in the minority of having this in place, um, and yet um, the argument is that a $5,000 cap isn't good enough. Um, I frankly think that a $5,000 cap is arguably even still too high um, because I think it doesn't do enough to stop what are in some instances abusive lawsuits. Just a couple of months ago, uh, the producers or the copyright owners in the movie The Hurt Locker who have filed tens of thousands of lawsuits against individual file shares in the United States, brought that north to Canada and filed lawsuits against dozens of Canadians at three Quebec-based uh, ISPs, Bell, Videotron, and Kojiko. Uh, all three ISPs handed over the names of uh, the subscribers who were identified by virtue of their IP address, and I would venture to say that the copyright owner here has no expectation of seeking $20,000 um, for the infringement. 
What they are going to do, because it's what they've done already in the United States, is send a letter to each of these individuals letting them know that they are willing to settle this for between three and four thousand dollars. I know it won an Oscar, um, but the notion that it's worth three to four thousand dollars for someone who may have downloaded that music it seems to me to be positively absurd. Um, yeah, that's the approach that's being taken, and I would note that even with a five thousand dollar cap, this doesn't go away. The typical settlement price that we've seen, even in the United States, is lower than that. Uh, but nevertheless, that's one of the changes. I actually think it's a positive change. The industry doesn't agree. The second issue I want to talk about was ISP liability, the role that Internet service providers play in trying to deal with these various issues. Let me first uh, tell you that the, the industry describes this as an all-notice system with no consequences. What they're referring to is a system that this law would establish called notice and notice. It's actually been in place with most of Canada's large Internet service providers, the, the Bells and Shaws, um, and Rogers and Telus's of the world now for going on almost 10 years. And the system works as follows. There's a lot, a lot of legalese there, but the basic point of it is uh, a copyright owner sends a notification to an Internet service provider where they allege that one of their subscribers has infringed their copyright. They downloaded a movie or they downloaded a software game or a, or a music. Uh, the requirement, once the ISP has received that notification, is to take that notification, identify who the subscriber is, because the rights holder doesn't know. All they know is a particular IP address. They don't know who, which individual specific person corresponds to that IP address, um, to identify who that person is and forward along the notification to that individual. So they get the notification. It's called notice and notice because they receive a notice. They then forward along that notification to the <laughs> subscriber. At that point in time, it becomes up to the rights holder to decide whether or not they want to pursue the matter further. They don't know per se who the person is. All they know is that they've received a notification saying, hey, you've just infringed my copyright. I can tell you that literally on a weekly basis, I get emails from angry and concerned parents who have received one of these notifications alleging that one of their kids may have downloaded something, and they're saying, what do we do about this? The truth is it's fairly effective. The law would go beyond what has just been an industry practice in Canada for a number of years to say that the ISPs are required to do so and will face real penalties if they fail to forward along those notifications, and they must also retain the records uh, of the subscriber internet use for a period of time. That gives the rights holder the ability to go to court and sue if they like, and know that the evidence will be preserved for at least six months, and in fact, if they go to court, it will be preserved for up to a year. So that's the notice and notice system, a system that, as I say, has been strongly criticized by groups like uh, CREA or Music Canada. I should note again that if you take a look at the, the facts on the ground, the reality is the system has actually worked quite effectively. So it's been in place informally, as I mentioned now, for quite a few years. In 2006, the Business Software Alliance indicated that it had worked quite well from their perspective. Uh, the Entertainment Software Association more recently did a study, and while they, didn't, they, they kind of flipped the number on its head, they talked about the 29% that they said reposted content, 71% of people that they identified having received a notice uh, actually did not repost the content. But even more, the best data that we got, frankly, came from Rogers, who uh, earlier this year appeared before a parliamentary committee on what was then Bill C-32, and for the first time provided real hard data about exactly the number of notices they received and their effectiveness. And it turns out they are effective. They received last year over 200,000 of these notices, forwarding those on to their subscriber. That's a, a fairly large number, although they, would, they indicated that's only about 5% of their overall subscriber base. Uh, so the majority don't receive a notification at all. Um, but what they found was that as each, notice, as each subscriber received a notice, the, num the, the in increase, the, the instances of getting repeat notices actually dropped each time to just a third of the people who received the notice. So the first batch, let's say that 5% received the notification, only a third of those ever received the second notification, so they were down close to 1% of their <coughs> subscriber base getting a second notification. Third notifications went to a very small percentage overall, and they said that actually that extended along. There were like literally two subscribers who received a couple dozens of a couple dozen of these large numbers. They simply ignored them quite clearly. The vast, vast, vast majority of their subscribers uh, didn't receive any further didn't receive any notifications at all. And where they did, the notifications proved effective. And frankly, that's pretty consistent, not just with the data that we'd seen from the industry side, uh, but it's consistent with my own experience, where uh, all it takes is one of these notifications, frankly, to both educate and scare both the parent and the person who's uh, alleged to have infringed, and so the activity tends to stop. Now, 
Note that there are those that say that this, uh, the ISPs don't do enough under this system, merely forwarding, forwarding along notifications. I don't think that's right. In fact, Industry Canada conducted a study several years ago about the costs associated with this system, and they found, as you can see here, that for especially for the smaller ISPs, each notification costs them over $30 to send. Just the process of having someone identify who was at a particular IP address at a particular point in time and forward along that notification is almost the cost of the, month, of the monthly revenue that's generated from that subscriber in the first place. You want to talk about an incentive for an ISP to ensure that their customers are well-educated and are not infringing, start taking away literally the revenue you make off them on a monthly basis for a simple notification. It works very, very well. Now, the industry would like to see something more. They call it graduated response, where they say there are consequences, and in other countries, those consequences have grown to as big as literally kicking somebody off the Internet. Um, I think that raises fundamental rights concerns, and, and I think, thankfully, the, the government itself has rejected those. Thirdly, the enabler, so-called enabler provision. Now, this comes about by arguing that what the industry needs are tools to target sites that facilitate or promote piracy. Uh, in Canada, the poster child for this would be IsoHunt, a BC-based uh, torrenting site uh, that is itself essentially a meta search engine that identifies where uh, particular torrents for particular works. And they are, as I say, BC-based. The provision itself, and this is, I know, a lot of legalese, essentially says that where you someone designs an internet website primarily for the purpose uh, to enable acts of infringement and they're aware of it, uh, you can use this provision to try to shut them down. Now, I should note that I don't know that there's anybody that has come out strongly against uh, the enabler provision as being offside what you'd like to achieve. You, of course, want to achieve rules that ensure that we can go after sites that are promoting or facilitating piracy. And I would note that there are a whole series, as you can see, of conditions that talk about or criteria for what it means to help facilitate or foster some of this. The real question around the enabler provision, though, is in a sense, is it necessary or even what's taken the industry so long? Because the reality is Canadian copyright law today can be used, is being used, to go after these kinds of sites. Now, I mentioned it in the context of going after individuals. We've already seen that. CREA or Sony BMG um, back in 2004 filed a series of lawsuits against individuals for P2P. More recently, as I mentioned, the Hurt Locker case. But even more to the point around the enabler provision, uh, we have had lawsuits against torrenting sites here in Canada. In 2008, lawsuit against Quebec Torrent, which was a Quebec-based torrent site, naturally enough, um, shut down merely on the face of the lawsuit. And there is currently litigation ongoing in British Columbia against IsoHunt. Now, in a somewhat unusual lawsuit, IsoHunt actually starts it by filing a lawsuit to try to argue that they're operating <coughs> legally in Canada. Uh, and the industry turns around, and they don't say, as one might think, given that they say they need an enabler provision to go after these sites, oh, IsoHunt, you're right. There's nothing we can do here under Canadian copyright law. Go ahead until the government changes the law. What they actually do is defend the case, saying IsoHunt is wrong, and go ahead and countersue IsoHunt for millions of dollars for its own infringements based on current Canadian copyright law. I'd argue the real question isn't what's taken the government so long to provide the tools to go after these sites. It's why hasn't the industry used the tools that it already has, that it is currently using in Canadian court to try to shut down a site that has been operating in Canada for many, many years and doing so quite openly to the point that the proprietors of those sites are, are quite out there saying, here's what we're doing and we think that it's legal in Canada. Bring it to the courts and then see whether or not we actually need this enabler provision at all. So it's really, as I say, largely a failure to target the sites, not a legal one. Now, finally, the issue that gets the most amount of attention and, frankly, the one that I spend the most amount of time on, which is what's called the digital lock provisions, dealing with the anti-circumvention rules. Now, the industry would have you believe that the absence of uh, these digital lock rules are what is the primary, bi primary barrier to developing the legal market in Canada. They say, until we provide legal protection for digital rights management, or more accurately, for technological protection measures, which have been colloquially described as digital locks, this industry simply won't develop. Now, I'll remind you what I talked about earlier on, digital music growth selling, grow going faster in Canada than it is in the United States without these rules in place digital music sales larger than they are in many other countries. Most of them, many of those other countries already with digital lock rules in place. So it's not as if we haven't seen those sales taking place here in Canada, even without those rules. Within the music space, as we all know, DRM, which back when this was 
this debate started 10 years ago, um, was seen as a precondition to selling music online, has now been largely dropped when it comes to selling actual singles or, or CDs. Um, and we've got a whole series of services in Canada that do use DRM. It's not about whether or not you can use digital locks or DRM. Um, we see it in the music, we see it in movies. Uh, the, the reality is it's there, it's whether or not we need these specific legal protections for it. In fact, the, I, the, 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 the best indicator of why the notion that you need these digital locks to make P2P go away and develop a, a legal, a legal so-called legal market is the US experience where their digital lock rules, known as the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA, actually predate the existence of Napster. So understand, they've had those rules in place through Napster, through Kazaa, through Grokster, through all the various, LimeWire, through all the various services that are out there. They quite clearly, these rules, the idea that these rules are what is needed to stop this activity from taking place is undermined by now more than a decade of experience where it's clear they haven't achieved that, that particular goal. Now, I need to note that this is not an argument about whether or not you should be able to use digital locks or not. If you want to use digital locks, go ahead and use digital locks. I think, frankly, customers have made it pretty clear, certainly in the music area, that they're not big fans of it. Um, but nevertheless, there is no law against making bad business decisions. And if you want to use digital locks for doing that, by all means, go ahead. In fact, it's not even about whether or not there ought to be legal protection for those digital locks. I recognize that there are international rules that make the case that you have to have legal protection for digital locks. That being the case, uh, if Canada wants to be compliant with those international treaties, there is no alternative but to provide some legal protections. The argument is about what those legal rules actually say and do and the limits that they create. They're called any circumvention rules within the law, and I think they are best understood by thinking about three layers of protection. The first layer of protection is traditional copyright the music you write, the, the, the book you write, whatever the work that you happen to create, it enjoys copyright protection. It's that law that dates back to the early 1900s uh, and in fact continues to exist and continues to provide protection. Now there is a second layer of protection in the digital environment, which is the technology itself, the so-called digital lock. So it can, let's say in a DVD, it can actually create legal protection by making it difficult to either make a copy of that DVD. If there's region coding on that DVD, it ensures that someone who buys a DVD, say, in Europe and brings it back to Canada, it won't play on that DVD player. It's the technology itself. Now, what the Digital Lock Rules in C11 propose to do is to provide legal protection not for the work, but for the Digital Lock itself. So you get copyright here. On top of that, you get, it would help by three hands, you get technology on top of that, and then on top of this, you get another layer that is actually protecting the technological layer. So what it is saying is that attempts to circumvent or get around the technology that's protecting this work, that itself becomes an infringement. In other words, it's more about, in this case, protecting technology than it is about protecting the underlying work itself. That's what these digital lock rules are all about. The problem is that the way that the government has constructed this, the digital locks trump just about everything. So they say that even if your intended purpose in circumventing and getting around the digital lock is permitted by law, it's still an act of infringement. Let me give you an example. Think, for example, of a documentary filmmaker who might want to be doing a documentary on a band that has, let's say, a concert DVD that's out there. It's on a DVD. It's got a digital lock already in place. The documentary filmmaker maker can rely on a number of different provisions in the copyright law to legally copy pieces of that concert, portions of that concert, let's say as part of their documentary film. It might be for review or criticism purposes. Uh, and so they're entitled uh, by law to use a snippet without permission because let's say it's going to be a critical documentary and the band might say, no, this is unauthorized, you're going to be critical, we're not going to give you permission to use this clip. A uh, documentary filmmaker says, I want to continue to go ahead and do it anyway. I shouldn't need your permission, and the law gives me the right to go ahead and do that. If the documentary film is, as I say, if the, DVD, the concert DVD is on a DVD with the digital lock, the act of having that documentary filmmaker circumvent the lock to try to get at the underlying content itself becomes an infringement, even if their intended use here is fair. And now this applies across the board. It applies to your own personal DVD that you might want to play and it's region coded. You want to get around that so you can actually watch the movie that you went ahead and purchased. That becomes an act of infringement. 
You've got the electronic book that you've purchased and you want to move it from one device to another and it's DRM'd, it applies there too. It trumps virtually everything and it does so by saying that circumvention, even for legal purposes, even if your unintended use of the work is permitted, is itself still an infringement. And then it even goes further by saying the tools, which is effectively the software, they, they can't be legally distributed or made available. So we're going to try to put a ban on so-called circumvention tools or software. And on top of that, we're going to say any attempts to circumvent becomes an act of infringement. Now I should note there is an easy way to fix this, to provide on the one hand those that want to use digital locks to be able to use them and even have some legal protection for them and at the same time address the concerns that have been raised by many and that is to link circumvention to actual copyright infringement. You want to circumvent the lock on that DVD and try to sell a thousand on a street corner, that's clearly an act of infringement and the law ought to apply. But if you're the documentary filmmaker or you're whomever and you want to circumvent for a reason that is lawful, you should be able to permit it to do so. In fact, we shouldn't create a situation whereby the traditional balance that we have in copyright gets thrown out merely because a digital lock happens to be present. Now, that approach would be, I think, effective because it strikes the balance. It's compliant with international obligations and it's balanced. And I should note is supported by literally dozens of groups from across the country. Groups that include the documentary filmmakers or appropriation artists who are engaged in art and fear being locked out. Almost every single education group in the country who says this is a major problem from an educational perspective. Library groups, business groups, retailers, uh, internet companies, technology companies who all say the current approach simply isn't a fair one and there's a far more balanced approach that we could take. Civil liberties groups that say this could have an impact on the kind of speech that we have, archive groups that say we could literally be locking ourselves out of our own history if stuff gets locked down and years down the road people aren't, are in a position where they can't even get around those digital locks to, to access um, Canada's own heritage. And so many, many groups all saying that they're not against digital locks and they're not even against digital lock rules, they're saying maintain some form of balance. So that's C11, or at least the key portions of C11, and why I would argue that frankly it doesn't solve what the industry is looking for to the extent to which something is need of sol need, in need of being solved. I think there are things, however, that can be done. I would argue if there is one big issue that currently is faced in Canada, it's the licensing barriers to bringing many of these new services on board. If you take a look, for example, at Pandora, available in the United States, still not available in Canada, and you talk to Pandora, they make the argument that uh, the problem in Canada isn't a lack of legal protection. Um, it's the fact that the licensing system for people who want to offer up new innovative internet services are so complex with so many different rights holders and collectives that you're dealing with, with costs that are so high, it's a non-starter from a business case perspective. If you want to find a way to start encouraging some of these newer businesses and more innovative business models to come into the marketplace, you could do worse than starting with, it would be hard to do worse frankly, than starting with uh, addressing some of those licensing barriers. We ought to be using the tools that we have before we go jumping into new legal solutions that are supposed to solve problems. Why isn't the industry in particular, such as Korea, using the existing legal rules to see whether or not they work? If they don't work, then of course, let's ensure that the tools are there to ensure that the law is effective. But where we find that it already works, the notion that more legal rules onto rules that are already in place, it seems to me don't make a lot of sense. And finally, we ought to be thinking about innovative solutions. The idea that somehow digital lock rules are innovative. Rules that come, that date back into the 1990s when the vision of the industry was, um, let's take content, let's lock it down using this DRM, and people will continue just to view and purchase all this stuff in the same way that they always have, not interact with it in the way that they, they had turned out they do, not move from platform to platform as it turns out that they do, not become themselves new kinds of creators as it turns out they do. This is not innovative lawmaking at all. This is very old style lawmaking that, as I say, the experience in other jurisdictions has shown has done very little to work. There are groups out there that are proposing new kinds of solutions. Um, Songwriters Association of Canada, for example, has put on the table different sorts of approaches uh, that we could be thinking about that would seek to uh, reflect the reality that peer-to-peer -peer is here uh, and there are ways to try to address that and find ways to monetize at the same time. I think if we were serious about forward-looking solutions to the extent to which we need some of these solutions, those are the kinds of things that we ought to be talking about, not talking about trying to lock things down. 
And so that's my case for why this particular round of copyright reform anyway uh, isn't the cure for what ails the music industry. Thanks very much for your attention.